We are recording. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Okay. And Izzy, can you hear me all right? Yes, I can. Okay, great. It's always kind of hard to tell. Definitely. <laughs> I really see everyone's faces. All right. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Jennifer Lee, and I work for the City of Burlingame. And joining me this morning is my colleague Izzy from the City of Sunnyvale. And together, we'll be moderating today's program. Along with our co-sponsor, Bosca, and our instructor, I want to welcome all of you to our class. So before we begin the program, I'm going to go over some housekeeping. First, all attendees are muted by default. And secondly, the instructor will be pausing periodically for questions, and we highly encourage you to ask any questions that you might have. If you'd like to do so, you can do so in two ways. The first option is to use the raise hand feature um, at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you have it, if not, um, the second option is to type your question in the Q&A. I will then read your questions and the instructor um, can respond. Or if it's something that's related to a different topic, we might just leave them at the end because we will have Q&A as well. So don't worry if we don't get to your questions during the lecture portion. And lastly, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on Bosca's website afterwards. So first, I'd like to share a brief background on Bosca. Bosca is a special district that represents the interests of 26 cities, water districts, and private water companies, all of which purchase wholesale water from the San Francisco Regional Water System. Bosca member agencies collectively serve over 1.8 million people and 40,000 businesses in Alameda, Santa Clara, and San Mateo counties. Their goal is to ensure high quality supply of water at a fair price for the member agencies and their customers. And consistent with that goal, Bosca provides a regional water conservation program to support agencies in improving water use efficiency. Outdoor water provides the single biggest potential source of untapped savings. We're reducing outdoor water use through water efficient plants and innovative techniques can help conserve water to ensure that future water supply needs of our communities are met. And Bosco provides several water conservation programs. The Long Beacon program provides rebates to customers of participating water agencies for replacing their lawn with water efficient landscaping. And if your water supplier already offers the Long Beacon program, then you may want to consider adding a rain garden to your project where you can receive an additional $300 on top of the Lawn Be Gone rebate. And in the city of Burlingame, we actually just started offering the Lawn Be Gone program and the rain garden rebate. So check that out when you get a chance. A couple other conservation, conservation programs we have are the Smart Irrigation Controller Program that provides instant rebates on the Retro 3 irrigation controller. This controller can be operated on your smartphone and normally retails for $280, but through this program, you can purchase it for $100 plus tax. And lastly, we also have a rain, guard or rain barrel rebate program that provides rebates of up to $200 for the purchase and installation of rain barrels. And all of these, Programs are available on the website, bayareaconservation.org. And now I will turn it over to my colleague, Izzy, to talk about some programs in Sunnyvale. Oh, oh that's a great one. Oh, yeah. well, apologies, just kind of crashed on me. Okay. Perfect. Oh, that's weird. Let's start. 
sorry about that. No worries. All right, I can see that. Um, okay, yeah, so additional ways to save in Sunnyvale. Uh, the city of Sunnyvale encourages you to participate in rebate programs offered by Valley Water. We offer $2 per square foot of rebates for replacing your lawns and plants that require a lot of water with drought tolerant plants or permeable hardscapes. We also offer up to $200 in rebates for properties that connect a clothes washer to a gray water irrigation system. In order to qualify for these rebates, please make sure you apply first. It's very common for residents to get super excited about um, these rebates and go ahead and start transforming their lawns before they make sure that they qualify. So please make sure you apply first. Also, are you looking for compost? Because Sunnyvale uh, offers free compost and mulch at the Smart Station. You can stop by Monday through Sunday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. with your own shovel and container. Okay, additional information on water-wise gardening can be found on southbaygreengardens.org where they also have some uh, landscape designs and templates um, to get some ideas before you go ahead and apply for those rebates. And some upcoming webinars. If you enjoy this morning's webinar, please join us for upcoming workshops. You can register for these webinars at bayareaconservation.org. Uh, as you can see, Bosca has put together a great list of different topics uh, where you can learn new skills and a variety of techniques. So please check out their website if you're interested. The Water uh, Wise Gardening website provides resources to support residents in water efficient landscape renovations and management. Uh, resources include galleries of gardens with plants identified, plant selection tools, and a watering calculator. And uh, now I have the pleasure of introducing our instructor, Juanita Salisbury. She has a PhD in biopsychology, as well as a Bachelor of Science in Landscape Architecture. In 2009, she established Juanita Salisbury Landscape Architecture after working for commercial and residential design firms. Juanita has recently turned her focus to California, California native plant pollinator habitats and in 2016 established Primrose Way Pollinator Garden, the first of five pollinator habitat gardens in Palo Alto. The gardens combine her educational background, the biology and behavior food intake with the design expression born from landscape architecture. Her focus is to research and educate about these habitats, as well as exploring opportunities to inspire more of them. Juanita, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Izzy. No problem. And do we want to do the poll questions now or later? Uh, why don't we do those now? I'll pull up the first slide. And uh, let's, let's see what people have to think about things. All right, so while Juanita's getting ready, I have just launched a poll and there's three short questions on there. So the first question is asking, how familiar are you with California native plants? Do you have no experience, some experience, or do you think you are an expert? Um, the second question is, what kind of garden do you have? And this is multiple choice. So do you have a uh, turf lawn, native plants, non-native plants, or maybe you don't have a garden at all? And last but not least, uh, the third question uh, asks, why did you sign up for today's talk? And so we're just kind of curious as to, you know, what are some things we want um, our attendees to get from this program? Are you looking to expand your garden? Are you hoping to reduce your water use? Are you just interested in planting more natives or are you just joining in for fun? Okay, that looks like we have um, a mix of just about everything. Um, and uh, yeah, looks like a, a lot of people have non-native plants. So we'll be uh, talking some about how to switch over from those to things that work better in the environment. 
so uh, I'm yeah, I'll give it um, 10 more seconds and then I'll go ahead and end the poll. Looks like we have 91% of people answering, which is great. All right, I'm going to end it. Okay, all right, good. Yeah, so I think everyone can see the results now. Okay, so some half and half with some experience and no experience. Uh, a lot of non-native plants, some with no gardens, trying to reduce water use. Plenty more natives, yes. And then joining for fun, woohoo. Okay, very good. I hope it's all fun though. Um, just gonna put that down to the bottom. Um, so I'm gonna get started and um, Today's topic, thanks everybody for, for joining. Um, we're gonna be talking about selecting native plants, um, a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I take care of a few pollinator gardens here in Palo Alto, and we have a presence on both Facebook and Instagram, the Primrose Way Pollinator Garden, and we ha I have a YouTube channel, Primrose Way. We also have a new website, the primrosewaypollinatorgarden.com, um, if you wanted to volunteer for our gardens, you can do through that through our site and as well as um, more information about our gardens um, with our newsletter that I have uh, posted there. The gardens, um, there are five. There's the uh, Primrose Way Pollinator Garden, which was our first one, the Gwenda Street Pollinator Garden, Hopkins, Arcadia, and Island Drive. Um, and we are connecting two of these gardens via the Embarcadero Road Pollinator Corridor Project, which is transforming the strip between the sidewalk and the street into pollinator habitat. Um, if you're interested in looking at how these native plants grow in different conditions in shade versus sun, how big they get, these gardens are always open. Uh, they're a great resource to go and see if you like to look at, see how plants look and see what they look like, so you can make a better choice about what you put in your garden, um, that they are available for you as a resource. So today's topic, um, this is going to be not plant these particular plants. I'm not going to tell you exactly this is going to be good for your garden. Instead, what I'm going to give you are broad concepts, uh, things that will help guide your decisions on what to plant. So although I will talk about a few specific plants, I'm going to talk about broad concepts that you can then apply to your particular situation, because not every single plant is going to work in every single garden. So this is the way that people can take their take home messages and then apply them uh, to, their, to their gardens. We're gonna talk about what are plants. This seems like an obvious question um, with obvious answers, but there are some more subtle aspects that I wanna talk about. Um, we're gonna talk about how to get started with native plants and then look at maintenance and other considerations because native plants are something that are that are very special in the uh, ecosystem. So uh, here we have um, some very interesting um, things happening. How do you decide what to plant? Do you find yourself going to the nursery, being overwhelmed by flats and flats of plants, walking around with your empty wheelbarrow and not knowing what to choose? Um, so do you have a plan before you go to the nursery? Always try to plan ahead so you don't get overwhelmed by too many plant choices. Is there a better way to make plant choices? So do you go to the nursery and feel like you've accomplished a lot because like this guy here, who's bought a hanging basket full of uh, non-native annuals with a few dead ones here that have gone to seed and making the nursery person happy that she's moved some inventory is there a better way? And my answer is there's a better way. So we're going to talk about how to make a good plan uh, for plant choices. So <laughs> you can be like this guy here um, who obviously has a plan. You 
don't necessarily have to wear a tie, but um, one of the things that you want to do is to know how plants fit into the environment to fit in your situation. So like I said, not every plant is going to work in every single garden. Every single garden is different. And it would take way too long to talk about each person's specific situations. So instead, I'm going to tell you how to choose plants that will work in your particular situation before you shop so you don't become overwhelmed. And the, the, the approach we're going to take is an ecological approach. We're going to look at how the native plants work in an overall system of plants. Um, I do notice there are a couple of questions in the chat, even as we get started. Uh, so let me take a look at those. Um, uh, yes, there is a handy worksheet, definitely. Um, and who can see messages? Um, all right, so nothing, nothing that I need to look at. Let me close that chat. All right. So again, you know, have a plan. So let's talk about how you make those plans. Go to the next slide. Um, as I said, every garden is different. So we're going to use a system. So um, out of the chaos, you can come up with a nice plan um, rather than me telling you plant this or plant that. Although I do have some very specific ideas and suggestions about things that work well, um, you know, everybody is different. So, you know, you're gonna get a nice uh, ecosystem education here this morning that will help you choose what is going to work in your garden. As I said, specific plants won't work in every garden, but the system for decision-making does work in every garden. All right. I like to emphasize that nature is a living system. And so I like to really pay attention to nature's patterns. And once we understand what these patterns are, that will help us organize our decisions into this um, network of choices that help us guide then uh, what plants to choose. So, Let's start about talking about what plants are. Plants are the primary producers of food um, at the very ba ba base of the food chain. Okay, they are what is called the first trophic level and trophic just means food level. And it's not really a food chain, but more like a food web. And so we get energy from the sun um, and this is where the energy inputs come from. They all come from the sun. Um, and it's a continuous supply of energy. And that gets transformed into food uh, by plants. They take that energy from the sun and put it into other chemicals that other organisms can then chew on and eat and digest and pass into the food web. And in this case, we have a caterpillar. This caterpillar is sitting on a grindelia, one of the plants that we use in many of our gardens and very tasty. Um, here's a big fat caterpillar that then is passed into the food web. Um, and caterpillars are super important food for baby birds. They, that's one of the preferred foods that birds feed their babies because they're soft and juicy, much easier to cram down into a baby bird's throat than something um, that's pr probably not as soft and succulent. 37% of Animal species are plant-eating insects, so a lot of things chowing down on the plants. And this is critically important for our native plant choices. Native insects, the ones that we find in California, only eat those native plants that they evolved with. Insects are very picky about what they eat. They just don't eat anything, although sometimes it seems like things get eaten uh, indiscriminately, they don't. Uh, insects like specific chemicals. Um, and so we have to plant specifically for those insects. And you're probably going, Juanita, well, you know, why do I want insects to eat my plants? And there's a reason for that. Um, not just because that's how you get protein into the food web, but each of these insects, and here's a mind blowing concept, is a bag of moisture. And so we're transferring moisture into the environment where it's going to be conserved. 
And so if we're looking to save water, what better way than to save it inside living organisms? And that includes both plants and insects and other organisms. And we're gonna talk about pollinators too, the bees, uh, because they play a key role in moving uh, genes around in the environment, genes of those plants that other things eat. So they help uh, other organisms to access the sun's energy by helping to spread genetic diversity of plants in the environment. So you're getting from this slide a sense of sort of the overall ecosystem network here, how it's organized. Okay, so plants aren't decoration, plants are food. This means that made it your native plants in your garden will attract uh, many other native uh, organisms um, like insects and in turn birds. And so native plants become a critical parts in sustaining life. And they are also critical in helping to circulate uh, moisture through the ecosystem. And when you have moisture circulating through the ecosystem, it's more efficiently used. And native plants are the key in helping us save moisture. And so when I go to the nursery, one of the things that I use if I feel overwhelmed, is I look for plants that have holes in the leaves because I know I'm going to get butterflies and moths eventually. Why is it important to see native plants as food? Um, we know that native plants will attract a variety of native pollinators and other insects. So it's good to avoid making the garden an ecological trap. Um, an ecological trap is something in the environment that attracts organisms, and because of this attraction, makes it easier for them to be killed through predation or other means. So we don't want organisms not to be able to complete their life cycles. When that happens, uh, moisture is not efficiently conserved in the environment. Okay, so we want to help keep everything alive because that's how we keep moisture in the environment. We have it circulating through a variety of organisms. And why California native plants? We have so much diversity here in California. We are a biodiversity hotspot, one of about 30 on the entire planet. So California rocks the biodiversity. We have so much here. It's There's, oh, there's really no reason to plant non-native plants here because we have almost 8,000 species of plants, more than any other state in the United States. Many of these species are drought tolerant, which means once they're established, they use very little water. And we have a lot of pollinators here, about 1,600 species of native bees, more than any other state in the United States. Across the United States, there are 4,000 bee species. Honeybees are not native, we're not gonna talk about them. Um, we and we have such a huge number of, of native plant species, uh, largely because we have a lot of unique ecosystems. And within the, these unique ecosystems, we have a lot of different bee species. So these things are working together to give us a lot of different plant species. Um, insect species, including pollinators, are declining worldwide. And in some area areas of the world, insect species have declined seventy percent. So you can really do a lot with the right native plants. You can support the environment, you can conserve moisture, um, you can conserve biodiversity. Um, there's really a lot that happens when you plant native. And so what I like to tell people is that, um, you know, once you plant native, your native plant gardens enhance connectivity and complexity in the landscape. And um, it's not a linear relationship. The more you plant, um, you end up with, instead of something that happens like a straight line, you end up with these very complex nested relationships of plants, moisture, things happening underground, cloud formation. So, um, the, and the more that you plant, um, those plants tend to support each other. This is what the research, the science says. Um, and that leads to reduced irrigation needs because plants live in communities where they support each other, much like other organisms. It's very difficult to live on your own without a community to support yourself. And so 
less water use doesn't necessarily mean less plants. And what we have discovered is as we add more plants, we build this community and of plants and other organisms that will support and share water, um, nutrients and information. Um, and the more, when you're adding more plants, your garden then becomes a self-assembling living system. It starts to take care of itself. So a native plant garden is actually less work because it does take care of itself. And so um, yet another reason to plant native because it's actually less work than other types of gardens. And so what I like to tell people is to start with about 20 native plant species local to your area. So that's, that's a takeaway tip. Aim for about 20. Uh, to start with. And in your native plant garden, um, the complexity uh, happens both underground and up in the sky. And you can see that through tap roots that get into the groundwater, you are connected to the atmosphere. So, you know, that's just one, one way that you have connectivity. Roots connect underground. Um, you can save moisture by using rocks to trap moisture. You can leave the leaves under the trees to trap moisture. Roots will go towards moisture in the environment. Um, lots of different ways to trap moisture. You can use rain swales, um, rain gardens that then um, help water to infiltrate. And so you can kind of see some of these structures that can help um, with these transfer and uh, cycling of nutrients and cycling of water through the environment. So um, it becomes pretty, a pretty exciting place to be um, in a native plant garden. So what do we mean by a plant community? Um, and this is from the California Native Plant Society website, their vegetation glossary. A group of plant species living together and linked together by their effects on one another and the responses to the environment that they share Typically, the plant species that co-occur in a plant community show a definite association or affinity with each other. That means they play well together. And so you won't have um, a bunch of plants deciding to kick a plant in the community off the island, so to speak, that they don't like that plant. Um, we don't like to think about plants as, as like sentient beings, but they know in their way what's going on and who's in their garden space. Um, and they know these in ways that we are not privy to. It's a chemical communication. So um, if the plants are all doing well, that means they all like each other, all getting along. Um, if there's a plant that dies, there may be a disease or maybe the other plants don't like that plant. Um, uh, which is kind of an interesting thing. And so you, have, you can see this community and you can almost see like the communication that goes on between plants in terms of how they all are getting along and how they're all doing. And so we have a lot of different plant communities in California. Uh, we have coastal scrub, which is a picture of that. Uh, here's a, sort of a dune community. We have oak chaparral, and chaparral just means shrubs, so shrubs that grow with oaks, desert communities, redwood forest, and so forth. Here, both in San Mateo County and Santa Clara County, we're mostly oak chaparral, so we're going to be looking at planting oaks and those shrubs that go along with oaks, although that may not be everybody's particular situation, but uh, that might be the majority that we have um, today. And so what we see in this particular slide here, um, this was a, a little hike that I took at the northern tip of the Point Reyes seashore. And whenever you see flowers in the environment, know that you have bees. Bees are the things that are moving around the pollen. Um, and so the plant communities that you see are a function of the pollinators that live in them. Um, and so think about the bees as farmers whose function in the environment is to spread that genetic diversity of plants for other insects to eat. So plants, um, you know, are, you look at plants and you know that, you know, you know you have bees. Once you have bees, you have seeds, and if you have seeds, you have more plants. And so uh, those pollinators, bees mostly, are moving that genetic material around. So you want to aim for the majority of the native plants in your garden to be local species and appropriate for your local community.
So <laughs> try to uh, get the point across that bees then are moving that genetic material around. So here we have a, a beautiful bumblebee collecting pollen, which is genetic material. And she's spreading those male genes around so that we can have more seeds. And more seeds means more plants, which is a really cheap way to get more plants is just, you know, spread seeds around. So you might be going, okay, I see the larger ecological picture. So I wanna know what, what I need to plant. What, what should I plant? Um, and as I mentioned before, we have a lot of plants here in California. Um, my go-to resource for knowing what to plant is to go to the California Native Plant Society database, CalScape, where this is a screenshot of their landing page, which they talk about CalScape and contact them. It's a searchable database where they have a planting guide for information and resources, nurseries where you can click on a link that will show you what plant, what pl nurseries have the plants that you're interested in. You can create Excel spreadsheets and then butterflies, what's that? Um, but basically this is a great resource where you can look at um, all plants, trees, shrubs and so forth. So they break it down for you. You can search for specific plants or you can look at locations, like what's native to your city, what's native to your county, what's native in a general in the general vicinity and start there. That's a good place to start. But as I mentioned before, um, we're looking at the ecological uh, way to think about what to plant. My question then becomes who to feed because remember we're cycling moisture through the environment. Um, and so why not look at those insects that feed on those specific plants? And so in California, we have um, 1,368 species of butterflies and moths native to California. And so they show you which particular species that we have. And so why not plant those plants that those caterpillars will eat to help conserve moisture in the environment? The benefit is that you get beautiful butterflies flitting around and it's incredible to see and it will happen, it's a guarantee. Um, we know that uh, plant species need insects to survive, pollinators, because they spread the genes around. We know that speciation, getting variation on plants like bloom size and color and things like that happens more quickly with pollinators those insects that move pollen around rather than just being wind pollinated, which is very random. And the pollinators are spreading around plant species for butterfly and moth larva. So what you should do in terms of choosing is rank the plants by the number of species that use those plants to help decide who to feed. So if you have ranked the plants, let's say you've chosen amongst various shrubs, and you rank them according to the number of species that they feed, if you have a choice, you can't decide something that feeds 10 species versus something that feeds 50, choose 50 because that will have more connections in the environment. That stronger web of circulation of goods and services in the environment makes it more resilient. Simple tip but super important. So biological factors may be more important considerations than abiotic factors. That is those non-biological factors like climate, geology, and water for determining what to plant. The power of biology cannot be overestimated. So to get more resiliency, have more connections. Okay, so next slide. And in San Mateo County, there are 83 butterflies and moths native. In Santa Clara County, it's 87. There may be more, this is what CalScape says, um, but in our gardens, we have so many butterflies, it's crazy. And I have seen species that I haven't seen before. The more that we plant, the more species that I'm seeing. And it's just, it's just magical. So um, in terms of sequence, okay, you say, you know, I'm just overwhelmed. 
what do I start with first? Trees, start with trees. Trees are gonna be your bang for the buck um, in terms of saving water, circulating moisture through the environment, um, just basically kind of like being the anchor in your garden. You wanna fit in as many trees as possible, then um, choose your shrub layer which should compose over 60% of the plants in your garden, because remember that oak chaparral, those shrubs, chaparral means shrubs, focus on the evergreen shrubs to keep things looking green and glossy. And then over time, you know, you don't have to do it all at once. Add in uh, native grasses, native perennials, native bulbs, succulents, ground covers, and vines as possible. And shoot for a mix of herbaceous, those ones that die completely back, and the woody perennials, the ones that don't die back. And planting season has started, so you want to start planting in late fall. Well, although we've had a first rain and things are already sprouting, so you can start planting now all the way through uh, winter and spring for your best results when the soil is cool and moist. Use smaller plant sizes. Those four inch pots are much easier to dig a hole for than a big one gallon hole or Oh, God forbid, a five gallon hole or 15 gallon. It's just easier. Um, or use seeds, which is like the easiest, cheapest way to go. Makes things much easier. And then to protect plants, I like to use physical barriers like chicken wire or a metal basket um, over the top of plants until the roots are established and those plants are not going to be easily dug up by other things like squirrels and raccoons and possums and skunks. So start with keystone trees. And what do we mean by keystone species? So the keystone plant genera are those that form the backbone of habitat resources, which provide uh, food, shelter, and nesting sites. So um, the keystone species help other plant species to survive. Keystone plants provides food for dozens or hundreds of types of caterpillar species upon which countless other animals depend. So keystone species, remember when I said 10 versus 50? 50 is more of a keystone species than the 10, okay? The things that feed 10 species versus 50, because many more things are relying on that particular species. So those become the anchors in the garden. So the more keystone species that you have, the more anchors that you have and the more resilient your garden will be. So the takeaway insight here, by supporting large numbers of other organisms, keystone species provide critical connections in the environment. Those critical connections mean that you're going to be conserving moisture because connections are where you have moisture stored in organisms, in roots, in bulbs, in leaves. So that's how we save moisture. So technique to include at least a few keystone plants to provide a resilient native plant garden. Super easy. Um, and then in uh, San Mateo County, there are 22 tree species, lots to choose from of different sizes. So choose a size tree or trees that will fit in your garden. Trees help save water. Um, and the oaks, so here we have the coastline live oak, Quercus agrifolia, long lived, add shade and a sense of place. Probably not great for most residential gardens. Here we have my husband here, he's six feet, three inches tall. This is in the Foothill Park Preserve. Um, works great in a large area like that. So if you have the space, that's a great tree. Um, but there are other trees that will work. So, but what trees do in the environment, their function, they absorb water and release it into the air, cooling and cleaning it. They form half of the rain cycle. So they team up with oceans and help circulate water across the land. Without trees, deserts can form. Trees improve water quality by filtering rainwater and helping to slow down the impacts of heavy rain. And they reduce flooding and stabilize soil. So trees are good. And they also help cloud formation 
to uh, occur more often over forested than non-forested areas. So you can make a difference to the climate with trees. Uh, oaks, this is the, uh, the Hopkins Avenue pollinator garden. The anchor plant here is the, uh, the valley oak that we have. Just briefly, I'm not gonna go into this into a huge detail, but they used to be 61% of the tree cover in Santa Clara Valley and now are about 1%. Um, really support the whole ecosystem and no other trees come close to delivering all the ecosystem services oaks provide. So oaks are great. Um, but if you don't have room for an oak, what trees can you fit in your own home garden? And these are the dozen trees, not all of the trees, but the native ones that I have in my own home garden. And I cram in a lot. <laughs> I have Acer macrophyllum, uh, which is the big leaf maple. I have Cercocarpus betuloides, mountain mahogany. This is a great small tree um, that stays very narrow. So it's a great choice. It's evergreen, grows great in part shade. I even have the a willow tree, which I water by hand because it's such a keystone species. Um, I have elderberry, which is deciduous. Prunus alicifolia, I have three of those um, growing and they are evergreen, super low water use. I almost never water them. The box elder, our existing street tree. Uh, I have a couple of hazelnuts. I have several Prunus virginianas, um, Arctostaphylus glauca, the big berry manzanita, which is behind a wire cage so it doesn't get damaged. I have red buds um, and then I have the, a, the toy on. Um, so these are, like I said, I was gonna mention specific things. Um, they're not probably great for everybody's garden but there might be something here that you can use in your garden. I've had great luck with these um, and I'm a very lazy gardener when it comes to my own home garden. Uh, and these have lived for me. Um, and they provide a lot of uh, great foliage and texture. They're just wonderful plants. Uh, second, choose some native shrubs. Um, like I said, uh, about um, you know, 70 per 60 to 70 percent in your home garden. Choose those evergreen shrubs that don't go dormant, just to keep things looking lush and green. Some specific ideas. Um, in my own home garden, I use Vaccinium ovatum, our native huckleberry, which has a great uh, edible berry. Coffee berry, Frangula californica. Look at how lush and green those are. People say, oh, it looks like weeds or whatever. But when you have glossy green leaves, they look just nice and pretty all the time. Um, Arctostaphylus, those manzanitas come in different types of forms, ground cover, uh, shrub and tree form. And look at those green glossy leaves. You see a little bite taken out of a leaf there. Wonderful keystone species. Lots of different ribes, ribes viburnifolium. Not locally native, um, but still a good shrub that is very low water use, grows in part shade, uh, green all year. Super easy. And then add perennials. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because um, these are great plants, the perennials that you can just kind of layer in for a seasonal color, lots to choose from. Um, and then add some annuals. If you're jonesing for some color quickly, um, these are three that we like, very, very easy. Uh, poppies, of course, are our native uh, wildflower, that it's our California state flower. Um, super easy from seed, Gilea capitata, with these beautiful blue flowers, super seedy. Once you plant these, um, you'll have them forever. And then Phacelia tenacetifolia, also an annual uh, that provides a lot of nectar. Um, you know, lots of fun things to do. You can plant these in pots if you don't have a yard. Um, you know, even pots full of native plants are helpful um, for the environment. And the great things about the annuals is that you can swap them out every year. Um, in pots and get a lot of uh, nice color. And they're pretty. <laughs> Who doesn't like pink flowers? And so this is a Clarkia amoena mix um, that comes up year after year, seeds itself, 
this is at the Primrose Garden. And just look at these nectar guides on the flower. These nectar guides, these spots here, point the bees to the nectar. It says, this way to the good stuff. Um, and look how pretty those are. These bloom for a couple of months in the spring, and then they go to seed. You can collect seed, and you'll have a lot of seed from these. They'll come back year after year if they're happy. Um, a wonderful, very showy plant. They grow great in pots as well. So you're probably going, OK, I got these pl a plant palette. I know what trees I want. How do I lay these things out? Um, so the basics of plant layout. Okay, always have a plan. And I tell people use graph paper to make it easy. In your graph paper, you can have a square to equal one foot. And if your squares are eighth of an inch, then it can be one eighth of an inch equals a foot. So that's to a scale. Or if it's a quarter inch, then you have a quarter inch equals a foot at that scale. So you can draw things to scale. So, um, you know, add plants from your palette showing the plants as a circle and their mature diameter. So even when you plant them and they're like only a couple of inches, but they say that they're gonna be eight feet across, draw that circle eight feet across to get the plant spacing correct. So lay out the big things first and then um, layer in your other things so that the circles are overlapping a little bit or just touching. And that gives you the number and um, the spacing for those things. So this is how you can plan things out. And you want to have some pathways, um, maybe a couple feet wide for maintenance purposes. So, and they will also give you some structure. Lay out your pathways first. Okay, it's always better to figure out how to move through a garden beforehand rather than afterwards. Um, moisture in the environment. Remember, we're talking about moisture, how to save it. And you're probably going, OK, so I really want to keep things really low water use. And so how do I determine? Calscape doesn't tell me. I mean, it says low water use, but what does that mean, actually? And so this is a great resource. It is the Water Use Classification of Landscape Species. It's an online searchable database for plant factors and individual plant species and published by the University of California Cooperative Extension and the California Department of Water Resources. Basically, they show you the water use of particular species as a percentage of turf grass. So turf grass is 100%, which we know turf uses a lot of water. And you can plant things then that use 0 to 10%, which is very low, low 20 to 30%, of a turf, 40 to 60, 70 to 100 percent. So it ranks these plants based on their water use. So yet another um, decision that you have to make in terms of, OK, is it a keystone species, 50 versus 10 water use? Is it very low or high? OK, so these are all things that you can use to decide on particular species. and. Um, you know, use use these deciding the decision maker decision maker factors um, judiciously. So these are things that will help you decide. Again, we're using that power of biology to bring in and keep moisture in the garden. A moist garden um, is something with a lot of life. And one of the great ways I have used to keep moisture in to the garden is to use succulents um, and also to use tap-rooted plants to draw on things in the water table and pull up that deep soil moisture. Um, things that are succulent like succulents, Dudley Ahasii here, um, they just, their fleshy uh, leaves store moisture and so that's, they are a super great way to keep moisture in the environment. Um, when you see lizards in your garden, and this is one of the, the species I look for in our gardens to know that we're keeping moisture in the garden because this lizard is a great meal for some bird and it's nice and juicy. It's got moisture trapped in its, in its body. Um, also bulbs are a great way to trap moisture in the garden. Uh, some native bulbs go do completely dormant in the summertime after they've bloomed. 
but those bulbs that are underground are storing that moisture. So lots of different ways to store moisture. So when you pair these biological ways to store moisture with those uh, non-biological ways to reduce water loss using mulch, shade, rocks, and so forth, the more moisture that you have in the garden, okay? Because we're all about conserving it and circulating it through um, living creatures. Um, you know, if you're getting rid of your lawn, uh, which is using up a lot of moisture, one specific example uh, that I like to tell people, I know I said I wouldn't provide a lot of specific examples, but here's one, um, which is Ceanothus thrissiflorus, Yankee Point, which is a nice ground cover. And if you just want a nice green, solid ground cover that doesn't use much water, um, Ceanothus is a great one. It's a keystone species. Um, you know, super low maintenance. You never have to mow it. You almost never have to water it. You just have to enjoy it. Um, so uh, lots of ways to make it super easy. Um, and you don't have to have the lawn guys come out and mow it. So saving money as well. Um, so as I mentioned before, we're going to be saving time, money, water, um, all these great things with our non-native gardens are not our native gardens because they are less maintenance than a non-native garden with a lawn. Okay, we're just not going to be mowing it. Um, we're not going to be watering it as much. We're not going to be blowing those leaves out. Um, so it's going to really reduce what you do um, in terms of like, you know, taking care of it. Basically, you're going to keep the weeds at bay. And when I weed, and I've got five public gardens to weed, I do a little bit at a time um, constantly. So once a week, I'll do the rounds, I'll pull out the more egregious ones. And then I don't stress about all of the ones that are there, but over time it gets less and less as those native plants establish and they start helping me out by kicking the non-native plants out. Um, when we first plant, we were gonna irrigate those plants to establish them about once a week or so. And we're gonna water just outside of the root ball to encourage those roots to seek moisture and to really dig into the um, areas outside of their immediate root ball. And I always like to water in between native plants too. If there are two that are planted close together, water the space in between them because the roots from those plants will grow towards the moisture and they'll meet each other in the middle. And once they meet, they'll be like, oh, hello. And it's like a little handshake, okay? Um, prune sparingly to control that dried up dead material for fire safety. You don't have to fertilize, uh, amend sparingly or not at all. So you're saving money on fertilizer. We initially mulch to control weeds to help establish the plants. And then we mulch with leaves afterwards because leaves are the nutrients that have dropped down from the plants and they need those nutrients for the next year. So leave the leaves because the plants need those leaves that they've dropped because they grew them for a reason. Um, and then if you don't, but if you don't like the way that leaves look in your planting beds, I do what I call the skim coat method of mulching where I put like one chip thick of bark mulch on the top to get that even look. Um, you can leave bare areas of dirt because 70% of our native bees nest underground and you will have native bees. They, are, they can't help themselves. They love these native plants. So you don't need to use leaf blowers in planted areas because remember, we're all about keeping moisture in the environment. And what happens with a lot of these insects that feed on those leaves and that trap moisture in their bodies, they'll drop down into the leaf litter where they pupate and hang out as pupa until they're ready to turn into butterflies and moths. So if you blow the leaves away, you're blowing away that those little packets of moisture, those pupa, and you won't have butterflies. So you want to help them complete their life cycle. Um, and if, but if you do use a leaf blower, use it on the hardscape, the driveways, the patios, the walkways to clean those off, um, but leave the leaves where they fall. And you know, less work is so much better. You don't need pesticides, herbicides, or fungicides because once your garden becomes a self-assembling 
self-organizing system, things will be in balance. So you won't have problems with um, too many bugs or too many non-natives trying to invade or problems with uh, bad pathogens in general. You may have a few, but the balancing will happen as the system starts to self-organize. Um, how do you know that your, your garden's getting established? And um, look at this beauty here. This is Pisolithus arahizus or Pisolithus tinctorius, one of our local um, fungi that is also called dead man's foot fungus or bohemian travel. This is an indication that you're doing it right. This is um, an ectomycorrhizal fungus, which means it forms a, a layer on the outside of roots. And this particular fungus, which is native to this area, um, takes minerals from the soil and exchanges them with plants um, for carbohydrates, for sugars. So there's this partnership, this symbiosis that goes on. Remember when I talked about a community, this bohemian truffle is part of that community. And so um, one of the plants that we just recently planted is this uh, Bacchus pilularis, pigeon point, a great low growing evergreen shrub, that's a keystone species. Um, super easy, stays green all year, has the mycorrhiza on the roots. This plant is almost bulletproof if you're looking for a good plant to grow. Um, and so we know that this is going to be a good uh, partner with other plants in the community. Pruning decisions. Um, stems get used a lot for other things. Sometimes nature doesn't necessarily tell us what she's going to do with her old seed heads or dried up stems. Um, sometimes male bees, when they're taking a break from going after the lady bees, they'll grab onto a stem to take a nap. Um, what we like to do is prune as little as possible because we like to provide nature with all the materials that she might need for things. Um, we leave seed heads in place. Remember, we're, the seeds have moisture and other things eat seeds, even larvae eat seeds, okay? This is a, a native buckwheat, the coast buckwheat, and there is a, um, a, a larva of one of our native butterflies on there. And this is our native sunflower here. Um, and birds, this little uh, junco has got a, a seed there. And this little titmouse has um, also been chewing on the seeds. We leave seed heads, even though they might look unsightly to us, that's dinner for a lot, of, a lot of different organisms. So again, less work, more nature. Uh, pruning decisions, you know, one, this last year, um, last year I went out to cut down the goldenrod in our gardens because it looked unsightly and I thought, oh, I'll just go out there and prune. But the goldenrod forms these fluffy seed heads. There's a lot of fluff on seeds of various species. And there's a reason for that. So this was the reason here in January. This is the day I went out to cut down the goldenrod. And this hummingbird was collecting fluff to put in her nest in January, January 29th to be exact. So I did not know, and I'm learning things all the time, that hummingbirds nest in the wintertime. So Okay, nature said, what's the hurry, Juanita? I've got plans for my fluff. It's going to be in this great nest for this hummingbird. So it was less work for me that day. Um, nesting and shelter, you know, many insects spend a lot of time as an egg or a larva, months or years, and the adult lifespan is very short. They only become adults to basically reproduce, and that can be a few days, a few hours, a couple of weeks. But, you know, um, consider the larva in your environment. Um, each larva is a bag of moisture and um, nutrients and perhaps a meal for a baby bird. So, um, you know, remember planting native not only helps you conserve moisture, but these plants have this function of circulating moisture uh, throughout these networks. Again, pruning decisions. We like to leave about a foot of stem because things nest inside hollow stems. Um, a lot of native bees are stem nesters, who knew? 
So takeaway tip, if you do prune, leave about a foot of stem for the uh, stem nesters. Um, and bees will nest everywhere. Um, I use a lot of bamboo stakes in my garden and this I did not know. I spent a lot of time looking at things. And this little lady came out of my bamboo stake where she was nesting. And I have such a population of these leaf cutter bees in my gardens because I have so many places for them to nest. Nesting is part of you know, keeping that life cycle going, keeping those moisture networks connected. Um, and so when you add things um, like log piles, they don't have to be unsightly, they can be decorative looking, that adds niches to store moisture um, in babies and larvae and eggs. Um, and so another great way to keep moisture in the environment is to provide niches for nesting. Leave those leaves. As I mentioned before, uh, leaves are those nutrients that trees and shrubs, the deciduous ones where they're dropping all their leaves, um, have built up over the season and then drop to the ground to cycle those nutrients back. They need the leaves to do their thing. Um, and they also provide uh, places for species, insect species to overwinter and birds will find them and eat them. Um, you'll also find salamanders in there, frogs, crickets, all kinds of interesting insects and, um, and amphibians will also shelter in leaves. Leaves encourage that fungal decomposition, which is super important to get those underground networks. And so what we do is we'll rake the leaves um, around uh, trees and shrubs and leave a little space so they're not right up against the trunks. Um, and then if you like, you can weigh them down with a thin layer of bark mulch for aesthetic purposes. So leaves <clears throat> are ecosystem gold. You cannot overestimate the importance of leaves in the environment. They absorb water like a sponge, they filter water, they hold in soil moisture, they insulate the soil, they keep the soil cool. So do less work, leave your leaves. You'll be happier, the plants will be happier, you'll spend less money, and less time, and you'll save moisture. Bumblebees overwinter in leaf piles. They really like to be in oak leaf piles. Um, plants and seedlings grow up through leaf litter. So, you know, people, well, one of my plants like gets smothered. You can brush the leaves off of plants, but uh, plants have been growing up through leaf litter for eons, millions of years. So I like to let leaves break down and that we have things growing right up through them. Um, again, but bare soil is important. So if you have areas of bare soil, you know, um, bees nest underground. So we'd leave those areas bare. And, you know, it's, they can be small areas, maybe a three foot by three foot area, which is what this area is over at the Island Drive garden. Avoid creating that ecological trap. So. To keep moisture in the environment, let things complete their reproductive uh, life, their whole life cycle. Um, and so when we're using native plants, we know that with the abundant blooms for nectar and pollen, for bees and um, other pollinators um, and leaves that butterfly and moth species enjoy, your garden is going to be super attractive to these insects which is good because we want them to help cycle moisture in the environment. And so an ecological trap is an environment or things in those environment that lures those organisms into a, that can't maintain them and does not allow them to fulfill their life cycle. So what we do is we create pathways between uh, habitats so that things can travel between habitats to reduce isolation. A hugely important thing to do is to reduce light pollution at night. Um, this is a huge problem um, where you don't just have insects attracted to lights at night, where you can lose up to 60% of your insects in a single night by um, exhaustion or predation. Um, but it also interferes with bird migration. Birds migrate at night. And if, it's, if they're distracted by lights, they're not going to be as efficient as migrating, they're gonna be disrupted. So blackout curtains at, on your windows is a great way to help with that. Um, also to put your lights on motion sensors outside, 
use yellow lights, which are not as attractive, have shielding so that the light is directed downwards. Um, so try to create uh, as much darkness as possible. You wanna leave your leaves, eliminate the use of pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides. Those things get into the soil where 70% of our bee species are nesting. And those chemicals can actually interfere with the, uh, the development um, of the insect and reduce as much um, fume uh, exhaust from gasoline as possible. And finally, now that you've gotten the broad concepts of how native plants form this, um, this sort of broad conceptual framework for how to save moisture in the environment, among these other ecosystem services, the more that you understand all of these interrelationships in nature, you'll learn how to optimize the productivity of your native plant garden. And this will lead to an abundance of life as well as an enhancement of your appreciation and your role in caring for nature's complex beauty. Native plants save moisture because of the framework they provide. And with that, I will um, happily answer any questions that people might have. Yay, thank you so much for your talk, Juanita. <clears throat> So we did get a question, but I'll turn it over to Izzy um, to moderate the Q&A section. Yes, so our first question is from Bobby. Um, Bobby is looking for long blooming, blooming natives for shade garden. Is there a plant that you have in mind for something like that, Juanita? For um, something in the shade uh, that blooms a long time, you know, um, it's not a sh hmm. so uh, there are native plants that will bloom for a few weeks. Um, it can be difficult to find things that bloom in the shade a lot. So what I like to do is have a succession of blooms um, because <clears throat> then you have overlapping bloom times, and um, that way you have a continual um, bunch of color coming, um, and so. One thing that actually that I have put into our gardens that I like um, is uh, Heterotheca sassiliflora San Bruno Mountain, which is a, um, a perennial plant um, that will grow in partial shade. Um, and it has yellow blooms on it. And it, I like to use a lot, it is a powerhouse of blooming. It will bloom all year long. Uh, if you like water it once a week. Um, that sucker will just continuously bloom. Super attractive to leaf cutter bee, to leaf cutter bees, which is super cute. Um, and um, so that one's one that I like. It takes a while to spread out. Um, Quick question, that was, that was yeah. heterotheca and what was the- Sessiliflora. Sessiliflora, okay. I'm just pulling yeah. that up now so I can link that. Yeah, San Bruno Mountain is the variety that I like to use. And that one is super easy to propagate from cuttings. I don't like to generally propagate things from cuttings because those become clones of things um, and clones are not genetically diverse, but um, you can supplement genetic diversity with some annuals too. Um, but I like to have a succession of blooms. Um, if you have a sunny spot, one of the... Um, just powerhouses of blooms uh, that I love. Um, and I've been trying to get in. It's kind of like a big sprawling plant is Encelia californica. That is not local to this area, but it's a member of the aster family. So like daisies, it has a yellow daisy on it. And that thing will bloom for months. <laughs> I cut it back once a year because it can get big and sprawly. Mine in my home garden is about six feet in diameter and it will just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It's a coastal bloomer um, and it just, it provides larval food. It provides nectar and pollen. I call those plants three furs because you get three things out of them. That one is a great one for a sunny spot. Um, but the heterotheca is a great one for, for shade and it will bloom continuously. Um, I, I just love that one. And it does very good in partial shade. Uh, 
Awesome. Any other questions for Juanita while we have her here? Looks like we have no more questions. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> maybe well, I, hope, we oh, sorry, I, hope this, I hope this was informative for people. You know, maybe it wasn't exactly what they were expecting. But when you're talking about native plants, you because of what they do in the environment, you you basically have to like look at their function. Um, you know, as a designer, I'm all about form following function and the form that um, emerges out of native plants is more like these nested networks of connections. And so you have to talk about all these different connections to really, to be really an efficient user of native plants, um, which are super efficient, as you know, in conserving moisture. And so seeing how they do that gives you those tools you know, knowing how much water they use, knowing how many species they feed, knowing to start with trees first and to plant local. So you have like these things in your toolbox to help you guide your decisions. So you don't end up going to the nursery and buying the hanging basket of things that are already going to seed. Um, you could go to the nursery with your plan. You don't necessarily have to wear a tie, but you'll have made those decisions ahead of time. Um, and, you know, like I said, using Calscape, yet another thing in the toolbox for decision making, um, can help you research those local species that you know are going to do well. Another thing in your toolbox, go to native plant gardens, take a look at the plants that are growing there. Most of our plants have labels on them. Um, some don't, but you can use, if something's not labeled, um, you can email me through the Primrose Way Pollinator Garden dot com site say Juanita what is this plant um, or you can use an app um, that is like iNaturalist to look and see you know what that plant is and that the iNaturalist app I use all the time to identify species because there's so many to know um, which is how I identified the um, the bohemian truffle the Pisolithus tinctorius which is a great fungus, which, you know, whenever I see it, I think of that as a real gift um, from the environment because we actually use those spores to uh, line our holes when we're planting plants. So when I see them, I see one of those things, I dig it up and I take it with me to our new gardens and I sprinkle the spores um, in the planting areas to help establish our plants. So that's like nature saying, hey, Juanita, look what I gave you. Here's a nice bohemian truffle, not edible, but the plants will use it to, um, to learn about each other and to make those mineral sugar exchanges underground and your plants will do better and use moisture more efficiently. Um, so the iNaturalist app can be a real great tool for people um, to help identify plant species. So lots of tools to make decisions without necessarily going plant this specific thing or that specific thing you know it's like I like to empower people with things that they can use to help them make their best decisions and these are the best things I'm and I'm always trying to improve those tools so I, I make better decisions because I don't want to make things worse I want to make things better and so these tools that I use you know, these are the tools I use. Maybe these are tools that other people can use as well to make those better decisions. Awesome. We actually do have a couple more questions rolling in. Okay. Um, one question, if you have mature non-native trees, do you recommend replacing them? Ah, so it depends on the species of tree. Um, you know, if it is a, a weed tree, like, um, a tree of heaven, the Alanthus altissima, which is not a native species, I would cut that sucker down. Um, a species that is going to be invasive in the environment, those invasive trees you do want to remove. Um, if it's a non-native, but it's not gonna spread invasively, what you can do is you can do a succession. You can plant underneath of those trees 
to get a sub story going so that when that tree fulfills its life cycle, then you'll have something in place that will replace it. So things like the, um, the, the native redbud makes a great understory tree to eventually replace those trees. Um, you know, so those are helpful things to decide on, um, you know, when you want to start replacing your non-native trees. Um, you know, a lot of people have things like crepe myrtles, you know, I mean, there, there are low water use, but what I like to plant, you know, next to those trees that are wonderful trees, maybe uh, people like are the desert willow that we have, the chylopsis. Those take a while to grow, so you can plant nearby them, uh, your non-native trees, and eventually replace them when your native tree gets big enough. Um, and so that way you don't, you don't change things too rapidly in the environment. I like to do things gently and slowly because I'm dealing with a living system. So I don't want to like go in and do surgery without having a way to stitch it up nicely. Mm, definitely. And then we have um, two more questions, uh, both from Bobby. Will valerian tolerate dappled light? Valerian? Yes. Uh, I don't know if valerian is a native species. I can look into that now. Um, and then the second question is, what nursery might carry cuttings of Heterotheca siciliflora? Uh, so what I would do is go to Calscape and um, look up that plant specifically. And then it will show you what nurseries typically carries that plant. Click on the links for the nursery. And then uh, most nurseries have an availability list where you can look and see what they have currently available. If they don't have it, you can contact that nursery and say, when are you planning to get that plant? Um, it is a very popular plant. I've sometimes had difficulty getting it. Uh, but once you have a couple, then you can grow it from cuttings, um, you know, or you can try it from seed. Um, and that's one of the great things I love about getting a few native plants to start with is that I always end up with a plethora of seeds and more than I can use. So if people like to volunteer, I'm not, I'm not like saying anybody can volunteer if they're interested, but they can. Uh, I always give my volunteers lots of seeds to grow. So this is a perk if you want to be a Primrose Way Pollinator Garden volunteer. Um, you know, but that's one of the, the benefits of having these plants is that they're very uh, prolific in their seed generosity. <laughs> They'll give you more plants. Um, oh, um, you know, another plant I like to use that will do well um, and is very strappy and nice and evergreen looking is um, the native iris. And there are a few different kinds. It doesn't bloom all year, but um, talk about seed goodness. Um, these plants also, you can divide them up in, from the clumps that they grow in and get more. Um, it doesn't bloom all year, but it does provide a nice sort of a grassy look with the strappy leaves all year that's evergreen. Um, there are just so many different plants um, that grow nicely. Another one that's blooming right now um, that will actually do well in shade that likes to do um, growing kind of on a mounded area is Lysingia, which is um, a low growing ground cover that has, it's kind of a, a grayish color, very soft um, leaf kind of texture. And it has pink blooms, which I love, I love pink. And um, it's also a three for, we have larva on those plus uh, larva, uh, nectar and uh, uh, pollen. So that one's a great one. Um, super easy to grow, pretty low water use. And we do have it in shadier locations um, and it's a late bloomer. So it gives you something nice um, this time of year. Um, you know, but with 8,000, almost 8,000 species of plants, there's gonna be something that you can find. And part of the fun of native plants is what we like to call the hunt, um, looking for those treasures. It's a treasure hunt, certainly. Awesome, thank you, Juanita. Do we have any other questions? I don't think so. 
Um, so I wrote down uh, the native iris that you just mentioned. And what was that second one? How do you spell that? Because Lithingia. So it just got a new uh, Latin name, which I can't pronounce, but you can still find it under the old Latin name, Lithingia. That's L E S S I N G I A, Lithingia. And there's a variety called Silver Carpet, which I really like. Um, and uh, that, that just has performed really well in my home garden. And we've just added a few of those to our uh, Embarcadero Road Pollinator Quarter project as well. Um, so if you walk down um, Embarcadero Road near the crossroads of Newell um, Street, Newell, um, you can see those planted in there. Um, as well as in front of the first congregational church across the street from the Primrose Garden. Uh, we just added some in there as well. Um, but lots of, lots of things to try. One of the things I have noticed is that when there are species that are referred to as coastal species, um, sometimes those do better in a little dappled shade because if you think about the coast, it's a little bit cooler here than, or cooler there than here. Um, especially in the full sun. And so coastal species, I find, will do better with maybe a little afternoon shade. Um, I mean, who doesn't like a little afternoon shade, especially, especially if you've been baking in the hot sun um, all day. So dappled shade can be good for those coastal varieties. Um, if people are kind of hesitant, oh, it grows out on the coast, will it do well? Um, a little dappled shade probably is helpful for those things. You know, people go, well, I want blooms all year. I want color, you know, and you can actually achieve a lot of those color um, desires by doing things that are very highly contrasted in terms of foliage. So if you go with like a light gray green ground cover, like the Lysingia I mentioned, with a darker green ground cover, like the Arctostaphylus, that can give you a very striking look um, without having a lot of blooms. So, um, you know, if you want color, uh, contrast is a great way to, estab to establish sort of a, a color interest without actually have things that are blooming all the time. Design tip from Design World. Great. And Bobby just asked again um, for the address of the uh, Gwinda Street Pollinator Garden. Is there like a specific address that you have for that, Juanita, or? Could you say that again? My internet connection was weird. The address of uh, Gwinda Street Pollinator Garden. Because I'm looking it up online and I don't see it. Did you catch uh, it's, that? It's telling me my internet connection is unstable mm -hmm. again. Um, let me see. Um, OK, so uh, what is it? Let's see. Looking at the chat. It's in the QA. Yeah, I'm taking a look. Uh, let's see. Do, do, do. Oh, it's what, uh, separate from what, what is the Native Plant Society Nursery? Uh, California. So, California Native Plant Society uh, website that I was talking about has links to various native plant nurseries. Yes. Um, and so um, you can click on. If you scroll down, it will show you like nurseries that have that plant. Yes, four nurseries carry this plant. And then you can go to the various uh, nurseries there. But actually, the California Native Plant Society has a lot of different chapters. Our local chapter is um, the Santa Clara uh, chapter, uh, Santa Clara Valley chapter. And they have a nursery. And if you go to their website, um, you can see when they're having plant sales, um, you know, that sort of thing. One nursery that I like to use um, is the Grassroots Ecology Nursery that's located in the Foothill Park Preserve. And if you go to their nursery website, um, which I don't know if they have a link to it on the CalScape website, um, they have a lot of really great locally owned, oh, there it is. Um, there's that one. Um, yeah, um, close that. Uh, CNPS, yes, so they have one. Uh, just, you know, there's so many different choices. You know, you have to ask yourself, um, 
you know, what do you want to accomplish in your garden? You know, I mean, the, the, the point about native plants is that um, they're going to accomplish low water use for you in general um, when you choose low water use plants. Um, but then a larger discussion, which we don't, we don't talk about, are more like design things. Like, you know, do you want something that's going to be uniform? You know, um, so if you want a uniform look, you know, do a, a low uh, mast planting. And a mast planting is something that's like three feet or more in diameter of the same species, you know. Um, do you want things for accent color? So you can do maybe one shrub that's going to have a nice form that you like, a, a vase shape coming up. Um, or do you want rounded forms in your garden? So, you know, these are, and these are personal decisions. You know, what do you like? What is your aesthetic? Um, and, you know, I would suggest to people, you know, go visit native plant gardens, take a look at the plants that are growing there. If you see something that's a nice mounded look, nice, it has a bright green color, like that Baccarus pilularis that had that, that great mycorrhiza on the roots, then that plant's going to work great for you. Uh, you know, I love a bulletproof plant, and that one is, that one's fairly bulletproof. Um, we put our plants through the ringer <laughs> to, to test them to see what they work, because they're in public spaces, which, you know, I do the rounds once a week, and most of the maintenance I do is picking up trash, you know, <laughs> so, People walk on plants, they step on them, you know, irrigation systems break down, stuff happens. And so, you know, public gardens are a great way to get an idea about what those bulletproof things are going to work well for people who maybe don't want to spend a lot of time gardening, don't want to like spend a lot of money on things that are just not going to do well for them. Um, so they can see what's going to work in different situations. Um, you know, I mean, the, the, the coyote bush, that Baccarus pilularis pigeon point, there's also a variety called Twin Peaks that is, they're both low and um, mounding, evergreen, super easy, keystone shrub. Um, you know, those kinds of things, you know, it's like, oh, that works really great. Low maintenance. We're, we're doing a new garden. It's like uh, with six gardens now, I really want to minimize the work I do which, you know, I'm a lazy gardener. I don't like to get my fingernails dirty. True story. Um, so, because um, you have to scrub the dirt out. And um, so, you know, I'm looking for things in our gardens that are going to be easy for me to take care of. You know, I put my gloves on to pick up trash. I don't want to be pulling out lots of weeds. We do have weeds, um, but, you know, you can find plants in these gardens was what I'm saying. That are, gonna, that are definitely going to work for you. You know, these are all works in progress. Some plants live for 25 years. Other plants live three to four years. We have a mix. So something like, for example, some of our, our perennials, like the, um, the phacelias, those are short-lived perennials. Those are not going to like go for 10 years. Those are going to go for one to two to three years. Things like lupins, you know, lupins are great in the environment, but those things, one or two years max out of them for the most part. Um, you know, so you just have to reseed some of these things. Um, you know, people oh, died after the first year. Well, that's the nature of that particular species. Some things um, like oaks, some live 600 years, you know. So, um, you know, take into account, you know, if you want to just do it once and not spend any more money, then go for things that are going to be longer lived. If you're interested in trying a lot of different colors, maybe try some annuals, some short-lived perennials, you know, but don't be too married to those ones that are not going to, um, you know, last forever. Some of them do reseed themselves. So, and they'll move around in the garden, you know, if they're finding a better spot than where you put them. Um, and that's what happens in these native gardens, when I talked about these self-organizing assemblies, once the plants form these associations, the plants tend to, the ones that are short-lived perennials tend to move around where they like to be. It's like, okay, you want it to be over there. I thought you would do well over there, but you know better than me. So, you know, when you start taking your cues from nature um, is when you're going to be more engaged in making those 
decisions. And so that's an, another thing is in your toolbox is, is let nature engage you and tell you what her cycles are, what her connections are, what her schedule is, because she really has the ultimate say on everything. So another tool in the toolbox, let nature speak to you. <laughs> Great. Yeah. And I think that's a perfect um, thing to end on. So thank you everyone for joining us um, on this Saturday morning. As a follow-up to this webinar, we will be sending an email to everyone who registered with a link to the recording. And also Juanita, um, we did get a question earlier if you are able to share the slides. Um, I do know that you are using lots of really great photographs, so I'm not really sure if it's something um, you could send over email. Um, yes, the, the PowerPoint presentation is quite large. Um, I can make it into a, a PDF packet, um, which I'm happy to share. Um, it's still, great. That, that still is pretty big, but I will I'll package that up. It doesn't it won't have the animations on it, but it should have the live links to things still. Perfect. Yeah, I think that's what yeah, one of our attendees was asking for. Great. So I'll get that from you and then I'll just send one email out to the group with here's a PDF of the presentation. Here's a link to rewatch the recording. And then I'll also include some links that uh, Juanita mentioned as well. But um, as always, refer to the PDF for the full list. And with that, um, thank you and hope you have a nice rest of your Saturday. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.